Hi, I'm Joe Hanauer, and today I'd like to talk to you about site analysis tools and technologies and how to build efficiency with technology. So what I hope you learn today is how to collect accurate site data that integrates directly with Vectorworks. Understanding the advantages of a GPS surveyor, using data collected to develop a digital terrain model or DTM, and then the GIGO principle, which is garbage in, garbage out. I'm gonna show you how collecting good data allows for good data out. Creating efficiencies from design to construction and how a digital terrain model or DTM and 3D work isn't just about sales. So first of all, let's just look at survey methods and technologies. And there's a lot of different ways to collect site data. And I actually recommend using the one that's best for you. So most often I use my GPS surveyor to collect data. However, on some projects, a tape measure just works best. Or sometimes satellite imagery, if I'm working on a planting plan and I can get the, the information I need off the satellite image, it's a big time saver and can work really well. There's also drones and LIDAR, which is light detection, raging and photogrammetry. There's laser levels and site levels and, the, um, and then the GPS surveyor. So point cloud and photogrammetry, um, a, lot of, a lot of newer iPhones or smartphones have a LiDAR scanner on it. Some drones have cameras that, that are fixed with uh, LiDAR scanners. And what it does is sends a laser out and it measures how long it takes for it to bounce back and it calculates a distance. And it can develop a 3D image or a point cloud. And then you use an app like Vectorworks Nomad or Polycam to work with that data. This is an emerging technology. It's very useful when it's used properly. I think the accuracy is very decent and I do think it's getting better. Uh, Vectorworks Nomad is a very useful app and I would actually recommend watching on Vectorworks University, um, the program Photogrammetry and Point Clouds with the Nomad app. But for me, the GPS surveyor is the most accurate it's the biggest time saver and the biggest money saver. I still collect data on site. I get an output as an Excel file or a DXF that can be imported directly into CAD, including Vectorworks. We get a latitude and longitude and a height above sea level. We get one centimeter accuracy and we can use this for staking out projects. So the key advantages to the surveyor it's very accurate data in, it's very fast. It leads to an increased understanding of the site. I think anytime you measure the site yourself, you get a better understanding of it. I know Jens Jensen used to believe, um, the famous landscape architect Jens Jensen would believe that to really understand a site, you need to sleep on it. I've never done that, but I have measured my own sites and I do believe it. it really does help me understand what's going on. And I think this all leads to better design solutions, more confident estimates, and time saving for install crews. So using my GPS MLID RS2. So this is the uh, this is my iPad, and I'm going to do a, a small measure for you just to demonstrate how we use this. And to get started with it, we um, Plus the, press the plus sign in the upper right hand corner and it leads to this screen. I'm gonna leave the project the na name the same since this is a demonstration. And then the code library, that's just a set of codes that I use that's memorized. The most important thing here is the coordinate system where it says EPSG7599. That sets the coordinate system in my MLID surveyor so that I can then match it when we get to Vectorworks. There are different coordinate systems that people use, so we need to make sure they're the same in order to, to make sure our data goes together. And then I'm gonna measure a, um, a paver patio. And to do that, now you're, you're seeing um, the neighborhood I was in, and I can zoom in to the specific house that I'm at. And that little blue dot there is my GPS surveyor, so therefore it's me as well. Um, but I'm going to measure the paver patio, as I mentioned. I don't have a paver code, so I just type in paver, I add code. Then I have my choice between point and line. 
for a patio, I would choose line. And then every point I measure, it draws a line in between them. So you can actually see the patio take shape as you measure. So now I just press save. So I'm just gonna walk the perimeter of the patio and I'm gonna press save. And every time I press save, I get another point measurement. And you see that we're, we're getting a latitude, a longitude, and a height above sea level every time we press the point. At this point, there's an arc on the patio. So I pressed one point of the arc. I'm gonna go to the center of the arc, press another point, and then I'll go to the other end. And I will record another point. And then when I bring this into Vectorworks, I can just turn that into an arc. You'll also see I've stayed a little bit of ways away from the house. And with the GPS, it's important to do that just because you lose some of your accuracy with the uh, satellites and the correction uh, ability of the surveyor in order to get accurate data when it's when this when things get blocked by by houses and trees. So, in those cases, if you're under a lot of trees or, or need to measure in an area that's getting poor coverage, you can add a second receiver, and then the two can communicate together. But in this case, I have one receiver, so I just stay away from the house a little bit. And now I'm going to uh, move to just measuring some general points. So I'm going to set a new code. And for just general points, I use a code called uh, PTS. So I type in PTS. And now I, I want to do these as points, not as a line, because these are just these are just grade points. And then I can just walk through the yard again and, and hit the save button and I record points. So if I were doing this with a laser level or a transit or any other way of getting grades, I would have to locate these points also. In other words, I'd have to measure each spot that I am recording right now so that I could record it into Vectorworks or, or other CAD or drawing system. And you know, in the old days, what I would do is actually create a checkerboard measurement pattern through the yard. So you'd put pull tape measures off the house, you'd pull other tape measures or lines that were perpendicular to those, and you actually create a checkerboard and then you would measure at each each corner of the of the checkerboard. And it's a very time consuming process. So you would not only have to measure it in the yard, but then you'd have to create that checkerboard in your drawing. And then each one of these points has to be calculated. If you recall or, or realize how that happens, you record a base location in your yard, and then every point you measure is a relative difference in elevation from that. So you actually have to subtract uh, one from the other in order to create the, the elevation. So it's a very, very time-consuming process. And for this, it's not. For this, I'm just pressing record, and, and I have the location and the height above sea level. So it's very quick. Uh, I, if we wanted to compare times in a typical yard that we do, we work mostly in the residential world. So in a typical yard, we do uh, measuring with my surveyor takes an hour or less. And then importing that into Vectorworks takes the, the actual import and doing it is very quickly, but actually drawing and creating a full base plan with it takes me about another hour. So I have about two hours invested in it. In the past, before my surveyor, it would take me 15 hours more or less, sometimes more, sometimes less. So it's so this is an incredible time saver from two hours to 15 hours, and it's more accurate as well. And that's really a, that that's the demonstration. That's how long it takes to get that number of points measured. So it's very quick. What you're looking at here is the typical uh, comma separated file or CSV file that is exported from the GPS surveyor to Vectorworks. And you see just the columns, the point numbers. And in this case, this has been converted to a northing and an easting, and then the height above sea level, and then the shorthand code that I use in the last column. So now the fun part, how does this integrate with Vectorworks? So here is my Vectorworks, and we are looking at a, um, a project that we're working on. We're actually installing this project right now. But I thought it'd be a fun project to look at um, because I really collected data in a variety of different methods. So I just wanted to show you how they compare, how accurate they are. And then I thought I'd show you um, 
um, just some of the things that I use and, and how I develop my drawings. So um, this, what we're looking at is a certified survey map from a certified survey, sort of certified surveyor. And uh, what happened is the customer here purchased this piece of property. So they needed to do a survey map to, to combine the properties. I had already done a survey, which I'll show you. And this I think was fun because I was able to really compare how accurate my data is to the surveyors. And if I just highlight the driveway here, you'll see my driveway is right on with the surveyors. And you'll see there's a little, little gap for me and for the surveyor to the house, and that's just a function of the GPS. If you look closely, you'll see there's a little bit of differences in the in the walkway, um, which is okay. I'll show you how that happened. I, I have a theory on that. You'll see there's a retaining wall that runs right through here. My retaining wall is right on with the surveyors. So, um, and then you see the road, the road is right on. So you see that, that the data um, when compared to a certified survey map is is very good it's very close and i might argue in, in a lot of respects that that mine is more accurate and more helpful to us what i wanted to then show is the certified survey map over the top of a satellite image and you can see from here that the driveway from the surveyor is very close to what we're what we're seeing on the survey map and there's a few differences here um, but but very very close You'll see the roadway is is really close right on. Um, but then I want to look at the walkway. And you see that there's some shrubs here that overhang. And I, I don't think the surveyor actually dug around into these shrubs to collect them. So that might be one reason why they are off. It kind of appears to me that they might have measured this line and then and then just brought this line over a distance. Um, and then use the satellite image to, to get the data. I don't know if that's what they did, but you know, there's a few differences here. But if you remember, my line was wider, so it was right out to where the image shows it, which is why I think mine was a little more accurate. The other thing I wanted to show you is if you're using a certified map or a, a, a satellite image, the image is actually taken um, up in the sky from from somewhere. And in my guess, this is this image was taken somewhere over in the sky from over here. And the reason I say that is here you're seeing the wall of the house from the survey. Um, but then you're seeing roof overhang here. You're not seeing roof overhang here. Um, you're seeing no overhang on this part of it and, and greater parts over here. So when you're using a satellite image, you just have to be careful of these overhangs and kind of guess where they are. And it, it, it doesn't, truly affect a lot of things if you're just doing a planting plan. But, you know, in this case, we're doing this front walk, we're doing a nice big outdoor living area uh, back in here. So we needed a little bit more accurate data than the satellite image. So, so we have all that, but I just wanted to point out some of that. I also did a scan with my iPhone uh, using the VectorWords Nomad app. And this is, so this is a LiDAR scan and it creates this 3D imagery that you can you can move and fly around and look, and it gives you a pretty decent understanding of what's going on on the site. Um, since I've been there, I can identify what some of these things are. This is that retaining wall that I was showing you, the accuracy of mine versus the surveyor. You can see the big trees that are in here. Um, you can actually see the shrubs overhanging this front walk. So you can pick out a lot of the site elements and you can eliminate some of your on-site measuring. For example, there's some shrubs right in here. This area gets really thick. Um, so, so if I move around, you can actually see the um, fence. There's a fence line that moves through here and comes down through here. So you can see some of the information that I wasn't able to get with my GPS. So you can see that this, is, this gives us some pretty decent information. And then if I overlay that, on the top of my my digital terrain model that I developed, um, you can see again that that there's a lot of accuracy between the two. You can see this is the 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 driveway, and it blends right in with the grades of of what I created with the digital terrain model. And you can see again this retaining wall in in my digital terrain model down here, and how these kind of line up. So you can see there's a lot of accuracy between the two, which is which is very good. Um, but I suppose right now you might ask the question of how did you get to this digital terrain model? So let me show you that. So to do that, I'm gonna hit um, a new file. So I'm just gonna go file new. I have a template I created from. So now we have a brand new drawing. And the first thing 
that I want to do is I, I want to geolocate this drawing. So to do that, I'm going to use the GIS tool down here, and I'm going to use the geolocate right there. Then this is the first window that comes up, and I want to use an EPSG code. So if you remember when I surveyed, I talked about that. So I'm going to hit this. I'm going to look at my EPSG code, which is 7599. And this is Dane County, so I know that this is correct. And I hit OK. And then I hit Close. And now what I want to do is actually geolocate it. Now I have the correct coordinate system. So to, to actually geolocate it, I hit the Search button. So in North America, the... Um, geolocation defaults to the Washington Monument. So that's what we're looking at here is, is the Washington Monument. But I want to set this to my site. So to do that, I hit the search button. I type in the address I'm working at. I click it and I press OK. And now that geo image is going to come in on the property I'm working at. And I recognize this property. Here's the driveway, the front walk. So this is the correct driveway. I'm now geolocated to this house at, at the point right here. Um, and now there's an, one more step that I like to take, which you don't have to, but I like to take it. It's actually taking an image of this. So that's a geo image right here. All it really is is taking a picture of this um, of, of of the geo image itself and saving it. So um, this is done better at a neighborhood level versus a house or yard level. So I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to use the the rectangle tool. I'm just going to take to draw around the neighborhood here and get a, a size about like that. It takes its picture and now it's going to regenerate there. It's done. Now I'm going to take, and I'm just going to switch to the arrow tool so you see what happens. The rest of the geo image disappears and I'm just left with the area that I drew my rectangle around. And then here's my house. Um, not my house, but the house I'm working on. And then uh, I am going to set this to its own layer. I have a geo image layer, so now it's set to that. Um, so now there's one more step before we can bring in our information. We actually want to set our user origin to match this. So there's there's two ways we can do that. I can double click right in here to bring up the menu, or I can come up here at tools and go to origin and over to user origin. And what I want to do here is I want to set the user origin to match the geo-referencing coordinate system. So this is the system we just set. So that's the 7599 code that, that we typed in. And I click that, and now, now my coordinate system and my user origin match. So at this point, I can import my DXF file. So I'm going to hit File, go to Import, Import DXF. My file is right here. And this is the import screen. I want to check a few things. I want to check to make sure my feet and feet are correct, which they are. Uh, I want to click on this file contains georeference geometry. And then I'm going to go to advanced. And I'm going to check a few things. Uh, this is already set to align with the internal origin, which is correct. I like to check my conversion. And I like to check to make sure my scale here is the same as the scale of my drawing. So this says 1 8 inch. I can come up here and look at my drawing. That's 1 8 inch. So I know it's going to import at the proper scale. Um, these next few things are generally correct, but I do like to check something in the GIS um, uh, for the georeferencing. I want to make sure that it's importing using my documents coordinate system. Um, this is all because I set that system. I, I set it to be the coordinate system of that 7599 EPSG code. So if it was set down here, it might come in different. I want to make sure it's matching what I set my document to. And it is, so I press OK. I press OK. And we will see um, there. My import succeeded. And you see my DXF file. And you see that the driveway matches the driveway. The walkway matches the walkway. The road matches the road. So everything imported the way I would like it to, which is which is perfect. Um, and the reason why I like to bring in the, the DXF file is because of these lines. When you import the um, CSV file, you don't get the lines that you measured with. However, I like to bring in the, the CSV file because I find these points a little hard to read uh, when I'm drawing and doing other things. So I am going to import the um, CSV file now so that you can see how we do that. So for that, you hit Landmark. 
survey input import survey file. It's right here, my CSV file. Come on. Okay. And here is important just to look at this right here where it, it's coming into a data format and it's the ID Northern Eastern Elevation. And you can switch this. There, there's other options. Um, I have eliminated the header file. If I had a header file up here um, in my CSV file, these two would match. But I can see that it does. This is the ID, the ID, Northern Easting. I can recognize these numbers. So I know that's right, the height above sea level and the description. So I know that that's correct. It's coming into feet. So I'm going to press OK. And in just a second, we'll see these come in. And there they are. So they're all in the, in the correct spot. I do like to put these on their own layer. So I am going to put them on a layer that I have called uh, DTM data. I usually have them in a, in a separate class as well. I have a class for the uh, site model and the points. That way I can just control these things the way I want to. Um, but at this point, um, I could I could freeze out the geo image. We don't really need that. So we can see the other points a little bit better. And there you just see the points along with the, the CSV file. Um, all the points right now are selected. So I'm gonna create my digital terrain model just by going to landmark. And then I go to um, create site model, site model from source data, and we get this screen. This stuff is all generally, generally gonna be okay, but I do wanna show you in the 3D display, I, if I click here on use geo image texture, um, then this, instead of being green or whatever you set it to, is actually going to be the geo image, which is kind of fun. And just like that, in that short amount of time, we have a, a, a contour plan and a digital terrain model. And you can see if I scroll around on this, oops, I lost it. Uh, there we go. Um, if we, uh, if we, this will act better if it's not selected. Um, okay, so so now we have our digital train model, and we can scroll around and look at it, and you can see how that geo image is on there, and and that that's all it takes to create the model. So that's how I got to this point on this drawing. Okay, um, now I thought I'd show you how I actually use some of this stuff. Um, Here's my plan. And so you recognize the house, the driveway, we have a new walkway planned and we have this outdoor living area um, in the backyard, a little water feature and fire pit. Um, so, you know, how do, I, how do I use the data now? How do I manipulate it? How do I use it for sales? How do I use it for my, my guys and my crew? Um, and I wanna, I wanna show you all of that. Um, what I'm trying to do is isolate my, my site model so that I can update it. This, this candy cane line here means that it needs updating. All right, that should be updated now. So, so here you see the plan. Um, the one thing I, I, I find important is with, with site modifier. So all a site modifier does is it, it's the, it's the skid loader, the bulldozer, or or whatever you're using on a piece of property to manipulate it. In Vectorworks, that's what the site modifier is. Um, so it's going to modify my digital terrain model from an existing to a proposed. And one thing I, I recommend you do is start thinking about elevations and elevation planes on a piece of property. For example, what I have highlighted here is a patio. Um, which is going to be one plane. But this plane actually extends right up to the house. So I can't think of it as just a patio anymore. I've got to think about this space. Same with my front walk. Um, so as I get into how I modify this, this will make a little more sense. Um, so if I just look at my modifiers, um, what you're seeing here is everything grayed out in the background, and you're seeing a few modifiers. And here's my patio modifier. Um, and 
when I look at this patio modifier now, you'll see that the orange line comes up to the house. It no longer just follows the patio itself. It's following this entire area. So that way I can flatten out and affect this area and then the patio happens individually. So now I'm thinking a little more globally and not just, not just patio. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then if I get into the modifiers of this patio, what's, what's fun about this is I can start to just manipulate the patio itself. Um, and you see all of the different grades I have on here. So when I'm when I'm doing this, I put a two percent grade. I start right from the house. I put a two percent grade out to the edge of my patio, and that's going to put a slope away from the building all the way in the plant beds through here. I put a two percent slope here. Um, anything running this way, I kept level. I have slopes coming down through here um, by having this two percent and and this a little bit less is that one and a half percent. I know that's hard to see, but that gives me a one point six. It's actually one point seven percent slope um, through here. So in other words, I've started to grade exactly how I want this to look, and that's where it becomes very helpful when when we get into um, what our digital train model is going to look like. Um, another thing I wanted to show you is how I manipulate the grade right around the house itself. So I have this um, site uh, modifier right here. And just watch right in here. You're going to see a little dark point that, well, before I do that, let me show you. This one is a um, the type of modifier it is, is it's a, a retaining edge modifier. So with a retaining edge modifier, I can I can create a level slope all the way around the house but I can also drop certain vertexes for the exposed basement right in here. So now I want you to watch right in here so you can see um, the vertexes. And if I, if I scroll down in the object info palette, you see corner vertex. Um, I'm gonna change that to, oh, that's not the one I want, sorry. Um, That's my retaining edge. Oh, I'm not seeing what I want here. I apologize. I'll move, move entire object. I don't want to move the entire object here. I'm just going to look at retaining modifier vertex. So now if I start clicking through there, there you see that black or that gray dot. Um, so what those are, are the vertexes. So if I get to this one, um, it's this one right here we're looking at. You can see my elevation is at 1056 and 5 ace. If I go to the next one, it's still 1056 and 5 ace. Then I go to the next one, it's 1052 and six inches. So it dropped about four feet right here. Um, and then if I continue to go around, it's still at 1052.6, and then it jumps back up. So what it does is it is it modifies the DTM to match the elevations right around the house. And then another very important modifier is defining your grade limits. So that's this this line I have highlighted right now. And that's basically showing the, the area of disturbance. If you don't have that, your other modifiers are not going to work properly. And then I have one modifier here that's just to define a swale. I use the path modifier and then just put a 2% slope through here just to create a swale around the patio. We did the same here. And then we have a few retaining wall modifiers and a few other things. But you see, this whole site is modified with just a few modifiers like that. And then uh, if we go to what kind of imagery that creates, here you see uh, the patio, you see the furniture and the fire pit and a little water feature in here. The house itself, I just use a massing model. Sometimes we draw the whole house and put, put siding in it and windows and everything, but you don't really have to. Um, I don't mind the massing model, it just creates this ghost. It actually creates a little bit more prominence for your project here, it's quicker. You don't have to put everything in. Um, so in this case, it just worked out just fine. And um, in terms of, of using this imagery for selling, I don't have to show a plan anymore. I can show this image and the customer understands very quickly what we're trying to do. So it's really nice just for creating this, this quick imagery. Um, and it's really nice for selling. But the other thing, it really helps my guys, my install crew to, to understand what it is they're creating. They see it. And I'm going to show you how I can use this data then to, to create information that is good for, uh, which creates eff efficiencies for the install crew. So there's a lot of advantages to this. And then, and then another um, 
advantage that's not always thought about is in anyone who has intellectual property, whether it's uh, a landscape architect or a landscape designer, um, an architect, anybody who works in our field struggles with the idea of having their intellectual property stolen and our plan stolen and us spending a bunch of time and then and then losing it. I do charge consultation fees. I do charge design fees, but there still is plenty opportunity for people to take my intellectual property. So if I'm selling and I show an image like this, I don't have to show a plan. I can just provide this image. And this is very difficult for another company to come in and 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 write a proposal and take the construction project from me. So it's really hard uh, with this to, to steal the intellectual property without a lot of effort. I mean, they can still do it, but it requires a lot of effort. They still have to go out and measure. They still have to go out and calculate grades. They still have to do a lot of work. So at least it, it provides some intellectual property protection. So I do like this for that reason too. And then I have the uh, another image just looking the other way. And that way my, my install crew kind of sees the curbing in here and they kind of understand a little bit better what it is we're doing. And here you can see that that digital turn, the um, site modifier for the swale. We had some modifiers in here for the retaining walls. So you can see those retaining walls and some steps that lead up. So, you know, you can start to see really how this whole project takes shape. And then what do I actually give to my install crews and, and how, what, how do we use this information to create e efficiencies on the install side? So here you see the plan. And I actually like to uh, produce everything on the 11 by 17 projects or paper that you see here. It just works well for the install crews. It's a nice size that they can deal with. Uh, with a whole plan like this, it can make a um, odd size scale. So this is a one inch equals 20. That's hard to, to build from. So then I'll zoom into areas and create a 1A scale plan. So this just shows the backyard. We'll do a dimension plan. Uh, in this case, everything is symmetrical off of a door right here. So we pull straight out and everything's dimensioned you know, on, on both sides of that. Um, I coordinate radiuses with an orange color and the dimensions here that are in orange then correspond to that radius. Uh, the same with this blue radius and this blue measurement. And then this zone right here gets away from the symmetry. You know, this, the rest of this is all symmetrical. So I just highlight that green and call that the adjustment area. So if there's anything that's that's off a little bit in here, um, my install crew will know this is where to make the adjustment. Now it gets even more fun. So this is a grading plan. A lot of numbers on here, but this is where we save a tremendous amount of time with our install crews. This is a plan that's really designed for the tools that we use. Okay, so I can take the Vectorworks, Vectorworks tools and manipulate them to provide the information that is best and, and most, most often used by my install crew. Let me explain that. I have now taken all of the elevations and I've lowered them. I use the um, move by 3D tool and I dropped all these tools so that uh, all these stake points so that I have a zero. So now I've given us a, a benchmark on site, which happens to be the door sill elevation going to be zero. I then put these stake marks all the way around the patio, right? Here's number one. You can see the one right there, number two. So it's just one, two, three, and it goes all the way around. This is a data tag. In the data tag tool, I have pulled the finished elevation from, from the stake that I installed. So this is the stake. And then the data tag has the ability to do some math. So I take... Um, the elevation of the paver, the elevation of my quarter inch, my three quarter inch, I add those together. And then I subtract that to create what is called the rough grade. So the rough grade, that's how far my install crew has to excavate. My excavator has to come and dig down. He's got to be minus two foot, seven and seven eighths inches below the door sill. And then he puts three quarter inch gravels into minus two foot, one and seven eighths inches the screeding love layer, the quarter inch to minus two feet, five eighths. And then when we put the paver on, that's gonna give us an elevation of minus one foot nine and seven eighths. So, so with this Vectorworks tool, we've created 
information that my install crew can get here. They can lay it out from the dimension plan very quickly. They have this, they can, they can start digging very, very quickly and they have the grades they need in order to do this. And then we actually use a zip level or a U level for this um, because with those you can set the zero. So we set zero here and then it, the measurement it gives you is this minus two foot seven or the minus one foot nine. So again, there's no math. So this is designed to work with a specific tool we have on site. And again, these are tools that are that are used to work with a specific tool we have on site. The zip level or U level that I mentioned for here, we find that it's not as accurate as other tools. So we use it for our rough work. This is all the rough work. Then when we actually do our screening and lay our pavers, we would need things more accurate. So we have a, a laser level, a grading laser level. And with a grading laser level, you can set an elevation pitch on the laser itself. So if I set my laser up over here, I can put a 1.7% pitch on it. And then every time we read the rod, it's automatically giving you the pitch. So my guys can set their rods here and they can set a rod here and they can screen this out and everything works perfectly. So it's really just a way of using the tools in Vectorworks to work with the tools we have on site. And this is this has been a big time saver, a big efficiency creator for us. Um, I also know and understand that 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 we work on a computer in an office and in the real world there's some there's some changes. So I always always produce this for the guys too. This is a chart of those same grade points. That way, if there's any changes or alterations on site, they can record them here, make notes. So if they happen to do all this work on a Friday, they come back Monday, they remember it. Or if a crew leader is sick and someone else has to step in, we have the data that we need to complete the plan. And then of course I do produce the images and give these to the guys so that they can see them and they know what, what they're building. So that's what we typically produce for a drawing. And again, these, these images not only help with the sales, they, they protect our intellectual property and they help the guys install. And, and the only way I got to this was creating a digital train model that I could create some of this data from. So that's, that's why I feel this is all so important. Um, another quick application of a digital terrain model. I've got uh, a, a property here on a lake. Uh, Madison is uh, built on four lakes. So we're always working on lakefront property. The lake is down here. I've got a, uh, there's an existing path that meanders down to the lake. Our project starts right here and there's about an 18 foot rise all the way up to this patio. And in this, uh, to do this project, we need to pull a permit and one thing that the county requires is um, us show which grades are above 12%. Um, they don't really care about the grades below 12%, but they uh, uh, care about the grades above 12%. So that sounds like a pretty difficult thing to calculate, but it isn't if you have an accurate digital train model. I just highlight my train model. I go to site model settings. I can go to graphic properties. I go to site analysis in here. I can have the site model calculate this all out. I only need to know above 12% and below 12%. So I'm gonna say I have two categories. I'm gonna have my one first category go up to 11.9%. That way my second category calculates anything from 12 to 50%. And I just pick 50%. There's not gonna be anything above that. So we have those two things. Um, and then I can actually, I, I'm not gonna do it here, but I'll, I'll show you uh, here. Um, here's my my site model. You can actually, when you do that, you can take a snapshot of the site model and save that. So that's what this is now. And you can see everything in red is anything above 12%. So most of the site. Um, so, you know, again, very quick way to calculate something that's needed for permitting. Here's a project, um, another lake down here. Um, this project was really fun. And when I talk about developing confidence in your design, this is an example of that. So I've got a property here, a new house being built. They tore down a house, building a new one. We have a lake, about a five foot grade change quickly off the lake. And then from this point up to the street, it goes up about another eight or nine feet. And the result is a driveway that slopes right at the house. I'm working with a civil engineer on this. 
and the civil engineer wanted to take this driveway and drain everything right at the garage and put a trench drain right along here. It's a solution that I just disagree with very strongly. Um, there's a number of scenarios that we can create that that will cause these trench drains to clog and cause the water to go right into the garage, which I just disagree with. So I have a digital train model. What I did is I took my driveway, I created a slope that's level right at the garage, like it has to be. I gave myself a 1% slope this way, a 1% slope that way. That resulted in a 2% slope here and here. Um, I labeled all the slope edges along here, uh, along the edges of the driveway in order to create a, a driveway that slopes down and then the water will drain right over into here and over into here. And then I have a um, site modifier that shows a swale coming down and there should be one over here, which um, I'm not seeing, but that's okay. But you know, th this whole process didn't take me that long in order to modify this, create this and create a site model that illustrated the way that this site should be graded. And I then sent that to the surveyor to which he looked at it and said, wow, you were able to figure out a way to do that and you did my job for me. And I said, yeah. And then he said, um, what should I do with it? And I said, just take it and put it on your letterhead, stamp it and file it for the permit. And he said, okay. So, so again, you know, when you have the information you need, you can, you can talk with other collaborators on a project with complete confidence. And that's what this allowed me to do. And here you know, I can show you the, um, images of this house. It's a beautiful property, but here you have the house. You can see from this fence that the grade drops real quickly in here. And then you can't, it's a little difficult to see how the grade rises up, but it does come up eight feet from down here all the way up. And it's just um, just a really fun kind of property to work on. So it was, uh, but the digital train model really helped me figure that out. And then you can see the swale as it comes down here. The other thing this swale kind of showed and identified is we need a retaining wall right in here, which you know would have been easy to miss without, without the terrain model. So again, confidence in your estimates, confidence in your design, not just for sales. So now what I'd like to do is uh, show you how we set up a drawing to use for stakeout. So um, what I did here is this is the patio that I, I was measuring before when I started the presentation. So that's the patio. And I just took a few more shots so we could create a digital terrain model doing a patio over here. Um, and, and I modified with a site modifier just to give it a little pitch in this way. And then I'm drawing in a swale to make sure the water flows out. And then we have these stake objects um, here. And then all we need to do is take this information and export it so that it arrives into the Emlyn. Uh, surveyor so that we can use it for stakeout. I have a worksheet for that. And so here we have a worksheet. It has my ID, the easting, northing, and the elevation. When we export to MLID, it's important that it's in this order. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't change the order of things. So you need to have your export file go out into the order that the MLID imports it in. There's a couple other differences as well. The um, what what we call ID in Vectorworks is called name in MLID. So I just had to make sure my header said name, but then in my calculation area, I'm having it pull the ID. And then the same with the Easting. Um, the MLID recognizes it as, as Easting. The uh, Vectorworks calls it X. And with Northing, um, MLID is Northing. Vectorworks is Y. And for elevation, Vectorworks is the Z value. So as long as that's set up right, it works. And from here, we just go file and we export the worksheet. And then from there, we can uh, pull it into MLID and, um, and actually stake out a project. And I'll show you that now. So here again, we are at my iPad and I'm just going to um, pull out a, one of these projects for staking out. And I have eight points along the swale that I just showed you. So you see those eight points. I'm just gonna press on point one and then we get the blue bar that says stakeout. 
And then we have where I'm standing, where the R is, and it gives me a line and a little direction arrow so I can walk right to it. Up on top, it's telling me how far away I am. And then as I get close, it turns into a target. And then once that target turns green, I have found my spot and I can mark it. So now I mark my spot. And then I'll just walk a little ways away so I lose the target and I can press point two. And once I press point two, I can hit stake out and then I can walk directly to point two. I get my target and I just wait for it to turn green. You can see how sensitive and accurate the emlet is. It's one centimeter accurate. So sometimes it takes me a minute and there we go. We find it, we can mark it. And that's really all it takes to, to stake out points on a project. So in summary, uh, you can see how the GIGO principle really operates here, that if we have good information in, we can get good information out. And in today's world, we are all so busy, and we need to do more with less time. So if I can take a survey that used to take me 15 plus or minus hours and get it done in two hours with the base map preparation, that's an incredible time savings. It's very helpful. So you see how the GPS surveyor will save time, increase accuracy, and save money. And then the data provided will enable you to do more with Vectorworks. It will increase your understanding of the site. You can use the model to create uh, 3D imagery, which will help and increase sales. And that 3D imagery will also help you with your install crew production. So you can see that there's a lot of advantages to having accurate data coming in.